Hi everyone, it's Melissa. Welcome back to my booktube channel. I wanted to make a video today with the best nonfiction that I read in 2020. I am probably the last person on booktube to post a video about um, my best nonfiction or fiction for that matter in last year, um, but I wanted to do it anyway because I read some really great books um, that I wanted to talk about. Um, and also to forgive the lighting a little bit in this video today, I um, couldn't quite get it to work and I probably need to invest in a ring light and a tripod or something, but um, anyway, it's uh, not the best so I apologize for that. But the books that we're here to talk about are really some great, great reads and I want to just get into it because there's a lot of them. Um, I read a total of 58 books last year and 31 were nonfiction and more than half of those 31 are more than deserving, I think, of um, being considered as the best of the year, you know, for what my opinion is worth. Um, as usual, the usual disclaimer applies when doing these lists. These are not necessarily books that were published in 2020, but rather ones that I read in 2020. So, um, so there's that. And uh, the overwhelming majority of these were written by women, uh, which is also something that um, I'm also kind of pleased about, although that really shouldn't be surprising given, given my uh, taste in reading. So, and again, these are not necessarily in any order. I think um, for the best nonfiction ones, I think they're in somewhat of the order in which I read them. I also have some honorable mentions um, that I wanted to talk about too. So let's get into it because the list is a little long. Uh, first is The Genius of Women, uh, From Overlooked to Changing the World by Janice Kaplan. Um, this was published in 2020 and it is based on the um, premise that we can tell girls that they can be anything that they want to be. Um, and that's what it says in the blurb. We tell girls that they can be anything. So why do 90% of Americans believe that geniuses are almost always male? So the book is based on that premise. So um, when asked to identify a genius, most Americans identify Albert Einstein um, as a genius. Rightfully, yes, he was. Um, but women are often an afterthought. Um, so Janice Kaplan reaches back into history to highlight many women whose notable achievements have been either forgotten or overlooked. Um, one of them in, or, or whose achievements were in, unintentionally or intentionally attributed to men. Um, one of the examples that she talks about is Einstein's wife, uh, Melina Marik, uh, who was a stellar mathematician and physicist in her own right. And so she kind of, she also explores the cultural factors that go into these snubs, like why, why this happens in the first place or why this did happen based on what was going on in history at the time. Um, she talks about the, po the importance of positive portrayals in the media of smart women and um, also highlights some of today's trailblazers who are breaking new ground in the sciences and um, in math and in other areas and who are making history in their own right. So The Genius of Women was one uh, that I really liked and um, would highly recommend. Another one, um, this is this was an arc, so it is not the actual cover, um, but The Book of Rosie, A Mother's Story of Separation at the Border by Rosaria Pablo Cruz and Julie Schweitart. Schweitart, uh, I don't know how to say her middle name, Colazzo. Um, this is a memoir. It is very timely and insightful. I read this in March or April, I believe, um, but it's a memoir that goes beyond the immigration debates and beyond the headlines and documents um, R Rosie's journey uh, across the Mexican border. Um, she is a Guatemalan mother who has um, made that journey um, twice. Um, she talk talks about 
how the decision to leave her daughters behind and to take her sons to the United States. Um, she talks, she writes about, um, you know, the most, I think the, the most gripping part of the book was the forced, the forced separation of her sons upon arrival in America. Um, they were sent to a foster home in the Bronx in New York, and she was sent to a detention camp in Arizona. Um, she talks about her time there and the other women that she met, met there, um, and their, their kids. And, um, she, and then it, it ends on a hopeful note. Um, she writes about the advocacy of strangers and how this group of mothers, um, formed together, led by, uh, Julie Colazzo to really, um, to provide support for the women in terms of, you know, their, their bail, in terms of their bail money. Um, so they, you know, they raised the money from their networks and it became a huge effort, uh, that has, um, yeah, that really has helped, um, uh, several other immigrant women. So it, it's about their, their life in Guatemala, the reasons that they left. Um, it, it, it just really was, um, really very, uh, very profound and very, and one that I really enjoyed. Um, the next book that I wanted to talk about was The Pink Line, uh, Journeys Across the World's Queer Frontiers by Marka Visser. Um, this is also, it was also an arc, um, and so probably not the, the cover that it, um, you know, the actual cover that it was. So this one takes a well-researched look and a sobering look um, at how the human rights frontier around sexual orientation and gender identity has come to divide and describe the world in new ways. Um, this is extensively researched. It is uh, 460 pages and an, an additional 100 pages of notes um, in the book. Um, he includes the like, personal stories of people who identify as LGBTQ in Malawi, South Africa, Uganda, Nairobi, Cairo, Moscow, Colombia, Mexico, Guadalajara, and other places. Um, he talks about the culture wars that happen, you know, about geopolitics, history, and religion. Um, I found this to be incredibly interesting and eye-opening. Uh, I did not know um, too much about LGBTQ right, human rights around the world um, before I read this, um, you know, and I thought, thought it was well worth it. Um, anyone who is interested in these issues and in history would, um, would probably really enjoy this one. Um, so, is that the second one I don't have a book, uh, uh, the actual book for, maybe you can kind of see it on my phone. Um, but anyway, it is Humankind, A Hopeful History by Rucker Bregman. Um, this one was published in 2019, but it just, I believe came out in the United States here, um, this year. Um, and it, it, it talks about the premise that, um, at their heart, it, it tries to answer the question, at their heart, are people mostly compassionate and good, or are they selfish, greedy, and focused only on their own interests? Um, so given the prevalence of the heated vitriol in today, in, in America, in the climate, and the inflamed rhetoric that we hear these days, um, it's easy to assume that people are not necessarily, um, good. Well, there you go. Um. And so, so it's easy to assume that people are not, are, are not, um, how should I say, uh, good at heart. So, um, so what Bregman does is he, he uses some little known stories and anecdotes to prove otherwise. Um, his whole premise is based on finding out the answer to that question. And it's really not a spoiler uh, to say that he believes that humankind is actually good at heart. Um, he gives a lot of great examples of why that is so. Um, 
from history and he and for example he he talks about the lord of the flies and how um there really was a lord of the flies scenario that happened and uh he, he talks about that and um about the lost um people of polynesia and you know it, it's just a really uh interesting look so anyway um second book uh, the second book um i'm like not really very coherent today i really apologize for that um i thought i was more prepared for this video than not i wrote notes and everything anyway um fifth book that i have to recommend is why we're polarized by ezra klein um here in america you know it's no secret that we have just endured a very um divisive election um with two very decisive election cycles in our history um and you know as the title says you know ezra klein explains why we are so polarized um he lays out the the about how our politics coalesce around our identities our racial identities our geographic um identities our religious identities um and kind of traces it back um you know it it, it has to do with the climate now but it he also explains how the reason for our polarization is not necessarily entirely um, attributed to trump um, it has, it, it goes back further than that, and it has its roots in these other demographical factors. Um, so I thought that was really fascinating. I really like Ezra Klein a lot. Um, I'm a big fan of his podcast, the Ezra, Ezra Klein Show, which I had just learned he is ending. He's going to be doing more work with the New York Times, so um, I'm kind of bummed about that. But anyway, um, he's a great writer, a great thinker, and highly recommend Why We're Polarized by Ezra Klein. Um, his sixth book is Into the Tangle of Friendship, a memoir of the things that matter by Beth Kephart. Um, if you watched my best fiction of 2020 video, um, Beth Kephart should not be a, um, you might recognize the name Beth Kephart. Um, she is um, has the distinction of appearing on my best nonfiction list this year, as well as my best fiction. Um, and that's because I always enjoy her writing. Um, her the book that was on the fiction list last year was Wild Blues, and I talked about that in a previous video, which I will link below. Um, I consider Beth a friend. Um, she has been a writing mentor of mine for a long time, uh, long before I had met her, long before I got to, to know her and read more of her work. Um, this is a memoir. This was actually published in 2000. So this has been on my shelves, um, not, not for all of those 20 years, but I would say for a good portion of them. I think it's probably, um, Beth and I were talking about this and we think it probably, I probably have had it for maybe 12 or 15 years even. Um, and you know, it's one of those books that, you know, we all have those books that we want to save for like, the right time. Right. Um, so I, so I was, I was, I was saving this book to read at the perfect time. So uh, that came in May, um, and the circumstances that led me to read this, um, that led me to pick up a book on friendship, uh, I won't get into that, um, but it it was just the right book that, that I, I really needed. Um, in this memoir, Beth reflects on the various friendships in her own life, um, from a childhood friend that she lost touch with, and then um, resumed contact with um, friends with a, a neighbor that she lived next door to, um, her young son's uh, first forays into friendships um, and navigating that. Um, as with everything that Beth writes, this is gorgeously written. Um, it's thoughtful. It's exquisitely um, touching. I thought that this is wonderful. This is probably a 
a book that I'm going to return to again at um, other times. I'm so glad I finally read this this year. It really did come at the perfect time. Um, I think for anyone who may be struggling with a friendship, with um, a relationship that has, you know, may have been once strong, that is not quite as strong as it once was, um, I, I think this would really, really give some comfort and some uh, encouragement really. So anyway, Into the Tangle of Friendship by Beth Kephart, um, a memoir of the things that matter. Um, okay, so next one I also don't have a copy of. It is Sitting Pretty. Um, oh, let's see. What is it? I, I want to make sure that I get the the next book that I have for you is um, one that I have recommended to dozens of people this year. It's probably um, one of my top three recommended books. It probably will be for a long time. It is Sitting Pretty. I'll try to zoom in on this a little bit better. Uh, um, uh, Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary, res Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body by Rebecca Talsig. It is, there we go. Okay, you can kind of see that a little bit better now, right? So this, I loved this memoir. I thought that this memoir was just fantastic. Um, it is groundbreaking. It is candid. It's witty. It immediately draws you in um, into her life um, and her world with, uh, it's ca it has a casual and confident tone. Um, she talks about, and there we go. Um, she talks about her, inter Rebecca talks about her interactions with friends, family, and strangers, um, and through all that, she shows how, she shows very clearly how concepts such as ableism um, are so prevalent and permeated in our society. Um, she defines ableism as favoring, fetishizing, and building the world around a mostly imagined, idealized body while discriminating against those bodies perceived to move, see, hear, process, operate, look, or need differently from that vision. Uh, she talks about the lack of accessible housing, um, the dearth of gainful employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, she, she, you know, and those, those employment opportunities with health insurance that is so uh, obviously needed. Um, she shatter, shatters, cannot talk today, um, shatters misconceptions um, that people with disabilities are helpful, helpless and devoid of sexual attraction. Um, she writes about her friendships and how her friends perceive her. Um, she is a phenomenal writer. I mean, I cannot recommend this book enough. I think if there were, th there are a few on this list that I really encourage everyone to read. Sitting Pretty is one of them. It's a memoir and essays. It will truly transform the way that you, you perceive uh, and interact with people with disabilities. I, I, it is truly, it is truly amazing. Um, I will not say that this is inspirational. Um, it is, but um, I don't think that that I, I think that kind of cheapens the what this book is. Um, it, it's just it's just I, I can't say enough about it. It is just absolutely amazing. So get yourself a copy of Sitting Pretty. Um, anyway, the Best American Essays 2019. Um, this is. A collection that is edited by um, Rebecca Solnit. If you are familiar with Rebecca Solnit's work, you kind of, you have probably a sense of what you're going to be getting in these essays. Um, if you are not familiar with Rebecca Solnit's work, um, become familiar with it because she is one of the foremost thinkers and um, writers of uh, for this moment in time. I think that. Her writing is fantastic, and I absolutely loved almost every essay in this, which is really unusual to say about an anthology. Um, 
I'm not sure how many authors are in this. Um, I don't know if it says. But anyway, uh, it is, it's described as um, a searching, necessary collection that grapples with what has preoccupied us in the past year, sexual politics, race, violence, invasive technology. Um, so these are all issues that Rebecca Solnit um, writes about. So it's, like I said, it, there's no surprise that these are the themes that are um, included in here. Um, all of them are excellent. There's not a bad one in the bunch. Um, I love the best of uh, series. Um, you know, the best of, best short American short stories, the best American, um, you know, essays. And, and I, I love that whole series. So this collection of essays is absolutely stellar. Um, contributors include Michelle Alexander, uh, Jabari Asim, Alexander Chi, Masha Gessin, um, Jean Guerrero, Elizabeth Colbert, uh, Therese Marie Mahat, um, Gia Tolentino. Um, I tried to find a complete list, no luck. Um, but anyway, it, it's a great collection. It's relatively um, short, so it would be a great one to kind of dip in, in and out of if that is your preference. Um, number nine is Untamed by Glennon Doyle. I am a big fan of Glennon Doyle's. Um, there was a time that I was not, um, I was not really crazy about her, um, her book, Momastery. I believe that was the first one, but anyway, um, but it, Untamed is astonishing in its honesty. Um, she write, Glennon writes candidly about the ending of her marriage with her husband and falling in love with her wife, uh, Abby Wambach, um, and she writes so beautifully about this relationship, about the process of them falling in love and getting together, the impact on their family. Um, she It showed her the beauty and the joy that results from embracing your wild, authentic self um, that is free from confining societal, familial, and, re and religious expectations. Um, this one really resonated deeply with me too. Um, I felt like I was highlighting a quote on almost every page and, uh, I think it, it, it has a message that I continue to reflect on and think of about, um, would highly recommend it to anyone. Another one also don't have the cover of it is Loved and Wanted, a memoir of choice children and womanhood by Krista Paravani. Um, this was also published in 2020. And I'll see if I can get a copy of it on my phone. So, Loved and Wanted. Um, let's see if we could try to get a good angle there. Kind of tough to see. But Loved and Wanted, a memoir of choice, child, children, and womanhood. Um, this is a powerhouse of a memoir. Um, it is about living in one of the reddest states in America. That would be West Virginia. Um, about being married and unexpectedly pregnant at 40 years old. Um, Krista had, uh, at that time, two very young children. She was the primary breadwinner of her family, um, and she was working as a college writing professor at the time. Um, she consults with her OBGYN about uh, the possibility of a, an abortion, and she writes very poignantly about the obstacles in her state to getting um, that procedure. Um, she encounters and illuminates um, with visceral prose um, just the realities of conservative um, political agendas that masquerade as medical requirements and uh, the shameful healthcare disparities from state to state. At one point, her daughter, one of her daughters was born in California and just the difference between uh, medical care in California versus um, West Virginia um, is very stark and um, eye-opening, to say the least. Um, she talks about the environmental factors and the economic factors um, that threaten her family and the way of life of many others. Um, I thought this one was just heartbreakingly raw. It was courageous. I think this is a vitally important book, um, especially in these times. Um, you might kind of have 
since the theme of all of these, um, you know, it, th these just really talk about like the, um, you know, the various um, I issues of these times. So two more um, for my best of list. Inheritance, this is another memoir. Uh, it's a memoir of genealogy, paternity, and love by Danny Shapiro. I love everything that Danny Shapiro writes. Um, this one, uh, she writes a lot about family and identity. And this one, this memoir is uh, her latest book. And it's about, she took a DNA test um, with her husband. And the results showed that the man that she thought was her biological father all her life was not her biological father. And just the process that she goes through to come come to understand that. I mean, Danny Shapiro is somebody whose faith, her Jewish faith and who she is as a writer and a woman are wound so tightly together. And um, for that not to be true anymore is just, it, it, it was just a really traumatic thing. How she dealt with that trauma, um, her you know, her relationship with her family. She writes so well about her mother. Um, it is just, it is just really so wonderfully done. Um, highly recommend it. And, uh, so finally the last one that I have is On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal by Naomi Klein. Uh, I talked about this in a previous video. Um, this one is astonishing. It's incredibly well researched. It is um, very well written. Um, Naomi Klein has uh, dedicated her the last ten years, I believe, of her life to these issues, um, and so she is very well versed on climate change and um, takes no prisoners really in holding those people, those who are accountable for like big corporations, politicians, um, for the effects that we have now. Um, so experts have said that we have 11 years left um, to um, kind of not reverse climate change, but to make a difference for the future. And this is a collection of Naomi Klein's essays and speeches over the past decade. Um, in it, she lays bare the evidence that is right in front of us. Um, about why we need to take action now and the consequences that are going to result if we don't. Um, she talks about her firsthand experiences in the aftermath of hurricanes. Um, she talks about being in Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, um, a family vacation that she took to British Columbia where the sky was just uh, this milky white this whole time while she was there. Um, she, I mean, that, that essay is just absolutely heartbreaking and whatever, but I, I picked this up because I wanted to know more about her work, um, and about the Green New Deal itself. Um, this book more than explains why that it's needed and why the, op and the obstacles that, uh, exist to it. Um, it, I was also really struck by the, uh, hopelessness that she talked about, um, and the discussion of, of that, uh, she talks about how the Green New Deal can be financed um, and how we really do have it within our capacity to create millions of jobs while addressing many of the social justice issues. Um, I think that this should be recommended reading for anyone who cares about climate change um, or who claims to and the type of world that we'll be living in, uh, you know, if we don't get our act together really soon. So. Those are my best books for 20, my best nonfiction for 2020. Uh, a couple others that I wanted to mention, as honorary mentions, um, The Witches Are Coming by Lind Lindy West. Uh, Lindy West is the author of Shrill, which is also a TV um, series. Um, and Shrill was a fierce and witty and um, sharp essay collection. Um, that I listened to on audio earlier in the year. Um, she takes the oft-repeated phrase witch hunt and she claps back with what that means in this time. Um, there's a lot of references to Trumpism and, um, and 
you know, and his behavior and, and what witch hunt really means in the context in the age of Me Too. Um, I think that that's extremely relevant. Um, definitely worth listening to. Uh, Lindy narrates it herself and uh, is really good. The second one on my honorary mentions list is A Warning, which was originally published as Anonymous. Um, and who has now, um, Anonymous has now been um, known to be Miles Taylor, who is the former chief of staff at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so he was also the editor of the anonymous uh, New York Times op-ed in 2018. And the ideas and the warnings that um, he put forth in that essay, in that piece, uh, in this book, um, were were very uh, frightening um just the the um the lack of uh i i i don't really know the word but just just the incompetence of this administration um that is thankfully uh leaving um in two days and uh you know less than like 60 hours from now hopefully um Anyway, so it, it's a great, it, it is a really great read. Um, I think that it is, it's not on one of my, my best of um, fiction lists for this year because I think that the moment for that book was truly at the moment that it was published. Um, you know, I think that its purpose was to warn us about what um, could potentially happen. Um, we have obviously seen that with, with the insurrection that occurred on January 6th and uh, all the aftermath and that's happened since then and I don't really want to belabor that too much but A Warning was a great, great book. I thought it was really sobering. Um, third uh, honorable mention is I Want You to Know We're Still Here by Esther Saffron Four. Um, she is the mother of Jonathan Saffron Four. Um, his book, Everything is Illuminated, which I have not read, but which um, I was, when I was putting this video together, I was thinking of Kelly from Books I'm Not Reading, who had just read Everything is Illuminated, and so now I'm kind of like not sure whether I want to read that one, but anyway, um, this is uh, Esther's memoir. It is about, uh, it's a post-Holocaust memoir. Um, she is the um, daughter of the only survivors from their their extended families. So um, her mother was the only survivor person to survive the Holocaust on her side. Her father was the only person to survive the Holocaust on his side. Um, she it opens with her just talking about how on her mantle she keeps a collection of glass jars that are filled with dirt and rubble from um you know from the from the uh where her ancestors lived in Kolki and in Ukraine uh, and, and Trockenbrod um before they were all killed by the Holocaust um and so the memoir is about her trying to take the fragments of her life the very um you know, just the most minute pieces of information that she knew about her her um, family and how she could understand more about her history. There was a half sibling that survived the war and that, um, oh, yeah, no, uh, I'm sorry. Um, there was there was a half sibling who was killed in the Holocaust. So that that other than her parents was the person who was closest to her. She didn't have a single detail. She didn't have a name. She wanted to find out more about this. This is a really um, this is a really powerful memoir. Um, she writes about how her mother just when she had um, when the Germans invaded Kolki in um, July 1941. Her mother was 21 years old. Her mother just up and left with only a winter coat, a pair of scissors, um, and some other clothing. Um, she didn't even say goodbye to her mother, um, and she fled. And she and another girl that she met up with just kept like traveling around Russia, um, you know, depending on the kindness of, of strangers, um, 
for like more than 2,600 miles. It's incredible um, to even reach. So anyway, um, th this is this is a really this is a great memoir. Um, it, um, you know, she there there was a stranger who saved her father's life, and um, her quest to find that person um, just really just really wonderful. So. Um, Okay, only a couple more. Um, another one on the honorable mention list, We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders by Linda Sarsour. Um, Linda is the, um, she grew up uh, Pakistani, Pakistanian Muslim American. She is a feminist. She is one of the co-founders of the Women's March. Um, so this is about her activism um, and her life um, and her mentors. Um, she it, it, I'm probably not doing this um, this one justice um, in describing this, but it, it, it's really about um, being an advocate. Um, I have a friend who uh, was closely involved with the writing of this book, um, and again, highly recommend it. I think that it was great. Um, another one uh, on my honorable mention list is the biography Me by Elton John. Uh, we all know Elton John. We all know his story, but this biography really goes into a lot of his life. Um, it, the audio is narrated um, by Taryn, the name escapes me, the guy who played Elton in, in Rocket Man. Um, and it, it really does illuminate a lot of details about his life that I did not know. Um, thought that was really entertaining. Um, number six is maybe you should talk to someone, a therapist, her therapist, and our lives revealed by Lori Gottlieb. Um, that one I've seen on a couple other best, uh, best of lists. And it's about um, a therapist who go, undergoes like a very traumatic, um, the end of a relationship and how she comes to cope with that. But it's also the stories of her patients um, and being a therapist and her seeking therapy herself. And I think that if you are in therapy, if you are a therapist, if you're thinking of being a therapist, uh, I think it, that's a book that would be really great. Um, and two more uh, that I wanted to mention Three more actually. Um, Me and White Supremacy Combat Racism Change the World and Be a Good Ancestor by Leila Said. Um, that one has been on a lot of um, Black Lives Matter and anti racism reading lists. Um, it, it deserves to be. Um, it really, um, it re really makes you look at how you can um, address um, different aspects of yourself. In order to be um, more um, anti, in, in order to be more anti-racist and to um, be a good ancestor, um, another one, um, my, the penultimate book on this list is *My Own Words* by Ruth Gader, Bader Ginsburg. Um, I read the um, a biography of Ruth Bader Ginsburg shortly after she died, and then after that. I also read My Own Words, which was a collection of her writings, of her speeches, of her husband's introductions um, to her, to some speeches about her, and I thought that that was really, I thought it was a really great collection. And finally, the last one that I wanted to mention is Alone Together, an anthology of prose, poems, and interviews, and it's edited by Jennifer Halp. Um, this is one that um, looks at our collective experience with COVID-19. Um, it has a great, it, it's a great collection of, of essays and uh, interviews, like I said, and um, I talked about this, <coughs> excuse me, I talked about that in a previous video. I'll link to that one below since this is getting kind of long. Um, anyway, so those are my best nonfiction and of 2020 and my um, honorable mentions for this year, for last year. So I hope that th these sounded interesting to you. Like I said, I wanted to um, mention these because uh, I think these are some books that I have not really seen discussed too much yet on, on BookTube and um, think that they are well worth your time. So as always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate um, the support you're giving my channel. 
um, until I will talk to you in my next video real soon. In the meantime, subscribe, um, hit the like button if you like this. Leave me a comment um, below if, the, if any of these sound particularly intriguing. If they are ones that you have read, I would love to hear your thoughts. Again, thank you so much. I, I will talk to you again soon. Thanks. Bye.